Okay, I was just wanted to tell you a little bit about China and Japan, two different countries in a close proximity to each other, yet absolutely opposite in everything else. So we're going on, this is a map of parts of China and everything. And uh, up at the top we have Manchuria. I should have a stick or something, I guess, but anyway, uh, and the, across from Manchuria, of course, is the islands of Japan. And then just down to the left is the Koreas, and north and south and everything, and the Yellow Sea there. And just in that inlet from there, is and just barely inland uh, is uh, the Po Gulf, they call it. From Manchuria down and everything, this is Peking, which is the capital of China today. And of course, the Chinese call it Beijing. And this is the Yellow Sea coming down through here, and this is the Yellow River coming out. This is the Ganges River. And the Ganges now, you know, is the home up in the Himalayas here of the Three Gorges dam, the largest in the world in uh, hydroelectric output. And uh, it comes down and it winds up in the, the sea at a ancient, very ancient city called Shanghai. And uh, the story was that uh, many, many centuries ago, the big sailing ships, wooden sailing ships, uh, I call them the old time FedEx because they uh, went from port to port all over the whole Orient, and they hauled uh, supplies and whatever that were designated for one port, then they would pick up, deliver some, pick up, and take them to another, and this is the way they went. But they, anyway, they, uh, the story was that the, uh, the ships were large, heavily loaded and everything, strictly sailing, and uh, they had a pretty large crew. And the, the conditions on the ships were totally intolerable. And the crew, some of the members would get sick, occasionally one of them would die and they'd just toss them overboard. The story went on that I read was that occasionally somebody got pretty ill, wasn't able to do his job, and all of a sudden he became a liability instead of an asset over the top, over the side. So anyway, when they got to Shanghai and they pulled into the harbor there, they always lost a few of the sailors with jump ship. And when the captain had uh, completed all of his unloading and loading and getting ready to go, he couldn't sail because he didn't have enough crew. So he would take a pocket full of yawn, which is Chinese money, and he'd go into town to the powers that be and give them some money, and they would go to the jail or wherever they needed to go around town for some loafers or that. And they'd get fairly young, healthy looking guys, a bunch of them, and whatever the captain needed, and they'd just run them down to the ship, put them on board, and he'd weigh anchor and take off, uh, sailing out. So these guys all of a sudden found out they were someplace that they maybe they didn't want to be. And so it went on and said that this is where the word Shanghai came to be is forcing someone to do something against his will. So, I, that's from centuries back, so I don't know. <clears throat> anyway, from there you go on down. That, uh, at Shanghai, just inland on the Ganges, is uh, uh, the capital at that time was Nanking. And uh, uh, Dr. Sun Yan Sen was the president, uh, it was a, a uh, uh, Oh, goodness, I can't think of some of the stuff there. Uh, anyway, he was the president of, the, of China at that time. And he had brought a uh, young fellow up with him, and Chiang Kai-shek was his name. They had like four million troops. But troops is a bad word because they were all uh, peasants. And they were just, their life was just to try to earn enough so they could get some food, and that's all. They were hardly trained. They had very little in armament or anything. They just were, it was a poor army, but their strength was in mass. Four million, they had a large mass to go with. So Hong Kong is down the line a little bit further, and Taiwan is just out from it there, at the Pacific Ocean on out. 
And then you go into the South China Sea down, down the bottom down here. And right down below is Malaysia in this point, and uh, that's where they, the plane is lost right now that they're trying to find somewhere in that whole area there. Uh, the Bay of Bengal on around the, and uh, the Indian Ocean and up into the South China Sea. So anyway, uh, Hong Kong is just above that. But anyway, uh, they, Nanking was the center and, uh, for the party there. And uh, just up above it was uh, another city, not very far up, and uh, Chongqing. And then it went on up uh, the Yansky River about 500 miles uh, to uh, uh, Kunming was inland a little bit, but that was Chongqing. And, uh, the, and the Kunming was the uh, warehouse for everything. China always depended on the countries all over the world sending in merchandise and things they needed. They didn't have industry way back. And so they, uh, selected in the center of China, the town of Kunming. And uh, for everything that they had there, why uh, it, they stored it, and they brought a uh, warlord who happened to be a relation of Chiang Kai-shek's. And uh, they took him from warlord into the military as a general. Uh, yeah, as a general. And uh, he was put in charge of all that. But being a, more a, a warlord, he was also uh, accustomed to getting his way and doing things and, and taking what he wanted and that. So of all of the materials and things that came in to Kunming, a very good percentage of that was sold on the black market. So now back to Nanking, they had the University of Nanking, which was the most extensive university in all of China. This is the very highest learning institution. And they had uh, a group of young people who were intellectuals uh, that came from wealthy families. Everybody in China that had anything in the one line of yang, money, sent their sons only, not daughters, to Nanking for their education, a high education. And so they formed kind of a little fraternity there at Nanking. And they started reading the works of Karl Marx on communism. And they liked uh, what they read and decided to start the Communist Party, which is what they did. The idea was to overthrow uh, the government and to establish a, uh, a, a uh, party of their own then, the Communist Party. And so anyway, when they and they did achieve that, you know, but not until 1949. So Mao Zedong was the uh, chairman of the party then. And most of everybody here probably knew about Mao because he was a very heavy fi figure after the war and that. Uh, anyway, the, the, uh, from China and, and their uh, type of, of government and the type of people that they had there. They, it was just a different in, in Japan. Uh, Japan, the people were uh, cleaner and neater, uh, more educated, the children went to school. They had more control of the people and they were very warlike, had been for centuries. And they were called samurai. And almost every household in Japan, at some point in that household, over the century, somebody was a samurai warrior. And then for the ones who were of a higher intelligence and ability and everything, they rose from samurai up to shogun. And they were only had one person above them, and that was the emperor. And the people of Japan thought that the emperor was godlike, so they worshipped him. And they thought that it was an honor to be killed for the emperor. Now, I spent years in the service around an awful lot of GIs every place. Roosevelt was our highest person in the United States at that time. I never heard one single GI ever say it would be an honor to die, to die for Roosevelt. But anyway, the, the Japanese were different, but it makes for a tough opponent. Uh, so anyway, we, uh, 
uh, Japan acquired all the islands that they had, and they became a member of the Axis, along with Italy and Hitler uh, in Germany. And so they each had a, a side to, and work to accomplish. And so Japan uh, started buying every ounce of any metal that, we, that the U.S. had back about 1928 or 9. And so we had, right here in Stockton, we had several big junkyards. People went out to the old dumps and stuff and dug up car bodies and, and just anything that was metal, any kind. It was all brought in, sold, and it was all shipped to Japan. And they re-refined it and repackaged it, and of course they delivered some of it back to us at Pearl Harbor. And from there on. Anyway, uh, they, they, they uh, uh, had one more duty that the, before the war got really going, and that was because they knew that their biggest enemy was the United States, and that we had a sizable fleet out in the Pacific and around. Unfortunately, our fleet was on holiday, most of it, uh, at Pearl Harbor. And the Japanese had free reign of going to Hawaii and other places at that time under a friendship banner. But they were keeping track and they knew exactly where the ships were and everything. So even in the face of reports and shortwave radio and everything telling them that there was a large uh, flotilla and, and uh, air uh, group approaching the islands, the leaders in Pearl Harbor wouldn't take that. And they just said it was a flight of B-17s coming in from the States. So anyway, of course it wasn't, it was the Japanese. And they wrecked their, all of their, uh, out, out of their anger and everything uh, on Pearl Harbor. And that entire destruction of Pearl Harbor and all those ships took only 30 minutes. They hit and they just, those ships still there, we've been there and stood on the decks of, of, uh, over the Arizona and uh, some of that, and I have a couple of relatives that were on the Arizona, and still are down there. But anyway, uh, from there, they got, uh, they got, took that as a victory, the Japanese did, and then just 16 days later, they had moved a large a contingent of, of their aircraft, the same type they had in, in Pearl Harbor, uh, up to, uh, in, into China, and uh, they uh, actually ended to uh, Thailand, and, which is part of China. And anyway, they had uh, several hundred thousand soldiers on the ground in, in addition to that. So 16 days after they hit Pearl Harbor, they now came around the end and hit Rangoon, Burma. And they started in with them, and for 75 days without stopping, they bombed and strafed Rangoon, until there was just nothing left. And Rangoon, uh, well, Burma, all of those areas, India and Assam and Indochina and all of them were all called or considered to be colonies of Great Britain. And so anyway, the Japanese were successful in this and they took over all of, of Burma. Uh, the Japanese soldiers became very good at uh, at mountain living and making a living for themselves. Because the Japanese placed large armies out there with weapons, but no food. It was up to them to make their own living wherever they were. And they could do that. So from Burma, uh, they went north and they took a sand also. And eventually we had General Stilwell and uh, uh, Lord Lewis Mountbatten and two or three other generals there who were to go against the uh, Japanese. And, but uh, the Japanese had been so successful in bombing and strafing Nanking and uh, Hankow and then on to Chungking that, and they established their own air bases in China and they had just taken control. So the, the uh, Japanese, uh, got smarter, I guess, and, and more they, of their own power 
than they could usually use. Uh, and they made some mistakes and things in doing all that. But they uh, sent armies out without supplies, and they went against uh, the Chinese, and this was Stilwell's main job, was to uh, recruit and train Chinese soldiers. But when they did that, he kept them, Chiang Kai-shek kept them close to him, because he was afraid of the communist movement. And he felt that the other peoples on the Allied side would defeat the Japanese anyway. So it was a bum situation. Stilwell called for trucks, like 60 trucks they needed it, and all loaded with, uh, with supplies and that. And they gave him, I think it was 20. And he kept the rest around out there to, uh, to, to you know, keep himself clear from the Japanese and keep them back up where they'd gone up to the uh, Sanchi province, way up in the, in the uh, Himalaya mountains. So anyway, uh, they, they finally started gaining on the Japanese in Burma. Burma had, uh, it was the largest exporter of rice in the world. And it wound up in Assam. Assam is the world's tea plantation. And so all the tea at that time of World War II came from Assam. I don't know how much of it does today. But uh, Burma had oil wells, oil fields, and they had tungsten and iron mines. And uh, just a, it was a treasure trove for the Japanese because they needed the oil. They needed all these things for their planes. So, uh, we had General Slim and a couple of other ones there then that all united and went after and they were able to overtake them in, uh, in Burma. Uh, they were still up in the SAM and they had the Mayakina area which is in the north part of Burma and into a SAM. And this was where the original, uh, well airport I guess you'd call it, Mayakina was a huge air pilot, uh, port there. And the Japanese owned it and so this got to the point where uh, America became, the, in our intelligence planes are out there taking pictures and stuff. And they finally became aware of the next uh, move of, of Japan. And what they were going to do is to put a lot of airplanes throughout Burma back in the reaches of the Himalayas. And their next move would be to hop over the Bay of Bengal and take India. And had they been allowed to do that, they said that they would have then controlled roughly one third of the world's population. And we could eventually be having to speak Japanese. And in addition to that, the British owned India at the time. There was no Pakistan like that. And they had felt it was so remote that uh, nobody would ever attack them in India. But they were wrong. The Japanese were preparing. So they put in 550 some planes, the same type they used in Pearl Harbor. And I don't know how many, but uh, some of the guys thought they ran anywhere from 15 to 20 airfields throughout Burma and up in the areas of the Himalayas and that. And so they had to do something against this and stop them because all that Japan had to do was to take India, which would have been very easy for them with their large contingent of soldiers and everything to follow up. And then the next step would be to cross the Arabic Sea and go into North Africa. And Hitler was already in North Africa and they would have completed the circle coming around. So who knows what would have been in the world at that point. So now they discovered, intelligence discovered that they've got this 550 some planes stashed all through Burma and everything and they have to make a move in a hurry to stop them from crossing the Bay of Bengal and taking India. And we should have had at least three groups. A group is three squadrons, each one with 30 some pilots and 31 planes, 30 some planes. So they would, a group was roughly 100 pilots, 100 planes. If they'd have had three of those, that'd have been like 300 then, they could have gone against the 550 Japanese. But the war was raging in the Pacific and the war was raging in Europe. And everything that was built went to one of those two areas. Everything from all the other countries that was into the war effort. And so they still had the problem, they had to do something. So somebody, 
some intelligent person decided to come up with his own plan, and that was to select 32 pilots, just 32, one from each state. So they selected 32 pilots from 32 states. How fortunate could I be? I was the one from California. So anyway, they did that, and I got my orders. After graduation, I was sent to Muroc and uh, the dry desert out there to learn combat flying and, and uh, gunnery and that. And I was supposed to stay two months minimum. And within six weeks, they called just me in, gave me orders to report to Olympia, Washington. I happened to be the first one I got on the train, went there. And I went out to the little Olympia Airport, which is still there. I just visited it three or four years ago. And uh, I went to the office, and the, the CEO was there. And he said, well, you're the first one in. There will be 32 of you all together. Within a week, the other 31 came. And then we all met and talked to each other and found out we were each one was from a different state. So we kind of wondered a little bit, but that's as far as that got. You know, we're all 21 to 23 years old. And so finally, uh, the Japanese uh, did make the coast of, of uh, our northwest up there with a mother submarine. And it came in one night out to sea uh, by Brookings, Oregon. And they had two sealed compartments on this uh, sub. And one of them contained a little two-man submarine. So one night they put it out, and it came into the coast of Brookings, and it shot a canister of leaflets over the town. And leaflets floated down, and they said that we'll be here soon, obey all orders, and no one will be injured. So anyway, that alerted the whole Northwest. So instead of us leaving for wherever we were going, we didn't know, uh, we had to then start patrolling and monitoring the Northwest. That changed just a little bit for a month, extra month. And uh, then they had, in the, the other sealed compartment, they had a little uh, amphibious plane that could carry one bomb, incendiary bomb. And so twice uh, that plane took off, and they could sh shoot it off from the deck of the sub. And when it came back, it landed in the ocean, and they had a crane to pick it up and put it back in the sealed compartment. And later in the war, they caught this up in Tokyo Bay, and there it was with the two uh, sealed compartments, both one filled, just like it was there. So anyway, they, they sent them in on two different nights, a week apart, and over the forest up north in Oregon. And they dropped their incendiary bomb and went back for the sub. What they didn't know was that that's a rainforest. Everything was wet, so their bombs went off and they burnt a very small area, half acre or less, and so they did no damage. But anyway, we were then, we had to patrol the uh, Puget Sound, the Straits of Juan de Fuca, and out to the ocean, and then we went south down along the coast and cut back in at the base of Oregon, early California there, and again came back on up to our base at, and, uh, uh, or, uh, Washington. And uh, then uh, we did that for a couple of months before we were released to go. And then we were to board a train and head for uh, Miami Beach. And so uh, on the roster of people, of, of the pilots, they had uh, no one with a name that began in A. Mine begins in B-E, and so it was the top of the roster. We're all second lieutenants, they didn't know one from another, so they handed me the list and said, your job is to see that everybody gets to the destination. I had no authority, but I had to count noses and make sure they got on the train and, and get off when we were supposed to eat and whatever. When we got to Miami Beach and got off, right across from the train depot was a large car lot filled with all convertibles. So every one of the 32 of us, including me, went across and we rented convertibles. And we were there for over two weeks. They put us up in the Fountain Blue Hotel in town. It was horribly hot and humid and really miserable. I couldn't even put the top down on mine, it was so bad. And anyway, I had to report to Air Force headquarters morning and night, and that was, took over two weeks. And finally they said, your orders are in, and round up everybody, have them here at six the next morning. So. 
I had to get all the guys and tell them where to be at the airport the next morning at 6 o'clock. And they put us on a B-24, uh, which was a cargo plane, the cargo model. And so we had no seats or anything. We sat on our barracks bags and just at 10 walls. It was miserably cold in there and everything. And they gave me the orders of your seal. And they said, when you were 30 minutes in the air, you can open the orders and tell everybody where they're headed. That which is what we did. And, uh, and we found out we were going to go, we were going to wind up in Burma. And so now Burma pretty much belonged to the Japanese. So they finally built the Seabees, built it at a, uh, the city of Chittagong, the north end of it. And they built a, uh, a nice airport, runways, and everything. The closest Japanese airfield was 90 miles south, Akyab. So we had to watch out for them when we got there. And we didn't have any planes either. So after two or three weeks, we, excuse me, we finally got 12 in from North Africa that had been flying in North Africa for a year. So they were already tired P-38s. But we got 12 of those. And we flew those for the first month until we started getting new planes. And we finally got our full contingent of planes. We got 25, 32 pilots, but 25 airplanes. Our orders were to hit the Japanese as often as we could at their airports. And they moved their planes from one place to another all the time. So even when we had a uh, photo Joe go over, and when he was there, he'd find the planes at, at a certain airfield. By the time we got there, it might be two hours or two hours and a half or so, they'd moved them someplace. But when we did catch them, and we did get in a, in a fight, why we were totally outnumbered. Because we only had 25 airplanes, and at, at the first few days of missions, uh, we could send all of our airplanes. But it only took a few trips like that. We were shot up in the trouble with the planes. And I have two or three things from generals that were commending us because we were flying at less than half of our strength. And I can tell you that when I went over, and writing on my book, when I went over my records daily, everything like that, the average mission was only eight airplanes is all we could get off the ground. And when we got to a Japanese field, we could expect to and were attacked by anywhere of 15 or 20, and in some cases up to over 30 of the Japanese fighter planes. So it makes it a pretty tough deal. But we didn't know, but we were expendable. And so the, I guess during wars like that, there are many times when they have to sacrifice a small group to save a much larger uh, organization. And so anyway, we were there for two years to the week. And uh, at the end of that time, 28 of the 32 of us was buried over there. I got shot down. I was able to get out the following day that rescued me. I got, went down on the belt on the Burma Road. So now we have one other part there up in the, uh, in the city of Lido uh, in uh, northern Burma up into Assam. We had the, they needed to get the supplies across the Himalayas. And so when they finally took Mayakina and turned the big airfield back to the Americans and the English, then we flew all of our uh, supply planes and everything out Mayakina across the Himalayas and into Kunming. But they also decided they needed a ground route. So they took the 600 mile original Burma road from Lido down south and uh, to, uh, uh, well, they have to, to uh, just off of Mandalay. And uh, they, Lashio was the name of the little city there. And it was a railhead. And from there, they started bringing the Lido road down to it and then starting out in a rather northeasterly, and the picture was up here. This is a Burma road. And that was 500 miles of that. And the way they did it, there were 8,500 foot deep recoils down there uh, along this road. The road was just not much wider. As you can see the vehicles on there, they almost take up the width of the road. And they, they went up to some of them, the peaks are 15,000 feet. So they went all over there. And they had to rebuild 600 miles of road from Lido down to 
last year. And then they had to build a complete, chop it out, complete new road uh, over and come into Kunming on the other side into China. And so they had uh, 28,000 what they called engineers of ours. They were all black people. And they had little D4 caterpillars, and that's what they were building this road with. And then they had 35,000 of the coolies, or the peasants, peasants from China that worked on building that road for that uh, 600 miles, 1,100 miles altogether. But this is the road that they built. And I flew over it many times, but I'll tell you, I would never wanted to drive over it. They had areas where the granite in the hills, the mountain, just came right straight down. And like I say, 8,500 foot defiles clear to the bottom, maybe a raging steam down there and everything. And they had to cut out. So what they did is they cut just a little cubicle out of the rock there, and just high enough so they could drive the vehicles as you see through there. And just wide enough for vehicles to go. There were just areas where they could get two to pass each other if they needed it. So that was a pretty rugged type of thing, very costly. They said they lost a life for every mile. And the Japanese still owned that territory that they were making the roads in. So they had to watch, had to have guards on the, on the tractors with them. And they had special units out to watch for the Japanese to try and, and keep them off of hitting the people working on the road. It was a pretty tough situation. And anyway, they finally got it done, but it was only a few months before the end of the war. So it didn't really uh, serve the purpose that it was intended for. It took two, two years to build all of that. And that road still exists uh, today, but I don't know how much traffic is on it. Most of the freight then, before that, was shipped out of Mayakina. And this was with uh, DC-3s and uh, DC-6s and uh, cargo B-24s and British uh, cargo planes and shipped on across over to Kunming. In the meantime, the only people in China that had money and could buy the stuff off the black market was the rich merchants and the families and everything, Hong Kong and otherwise. And that was all the Communist Party. And so they were the ones who could buy the, the uh, stuff that was on the market. So they benefited from that. That's what helped them uh, take over China eventually. So uh, that's about where I am. They, we, on the day that we got to uh, Burma, uh, Chittagong, they, we found this panel of a cargo parachute. And one of our uh, people, uh, Lou Karatkin, was an artist. And he uh, put the thing up, and he drew a picture of Snafu in the middle. And he was a friend. And in the States before we left, his wife had come to be with him. And they'd gone to, we invited me to go to dinner with him a couple of times. So he was a friend. So he was a tremendous artist. And so what he was doing, it's a P-38 pilot, too. So what he was doing, uh, was built was to get this thing ready for signatures, which I didn't know. And when he got finished, I'm standing there, and he handed me the pen, he said, sign it, Bill. So Cecil can tell you a little bit about that. And uh, they, uh, at the, when the last person left over there, why well, I guess that's what it is, but I'll let Cecil tell you about the, the deal there. And uh, they, uh, like I say, 28 of the guys were buried over there. They've, I just got a fellow called me from about three weeks ago from uh, Minnesota. And uh, he said that his name, I don't know what the first name was, but anyway, he said the name. And I said, uh, are, is that your, his last name was Baumeister. And I said, are you talking about William G. Baumeister? And he said, yes, my cousin. And I said, well, I was with him on the mission when he got killed. He, was, he came in later. He was not one of the original 32. And uh, he flew on my wing for oh, several months. And then he got promoted to a first lieutenant. And uh, then he was leading somebody. So, but he did get killed on, the, on June the 6th of 1944. 
And I was on that mission. We lost three people, the, the uh, biggest ace in the CBI, George Duke, and uh, we lost another very good personal friend there, uh, Bertram Goodrich, and uh, all on that one mission. But we got jumped. The estimates ran between 30 and 40 Japanese. We were going to have 20 planes. We couldn't get that many going. So we wound up with 16 taken off, and three or four of them was, were still having problems, and they had to turn them back. So eventually we had 12 planes. And the estimates run that the Japanese were waiting for us. When we got there, somewhere between 30 and 40 Japanese planes were in the air against us. And it's, it's a pretty tough deal when you're uh, in an airplane like that all by yourself, even though we had the fastest and the best airplane that America had. Uh, it's still the Japanese could turn right inside of us. Their, their zero was like a uh, kite in the wind. It just flipped around. And we had to really watch because the 38 is a pretty big airplane, pretty heavy. It takes a little more room to make the turn. But anyway, uh, that was about uh, what happened to us and everything. The 459th Fighter Squadron didn't even have a number on it until we got to Calcutta. And there, General Davidson, who was the head of 10th Air Force, and some other generals, Lewis Mountbatten and that, Lord Lewis Mountbatten, all decided to uh, come up with a number, and that was a 459th. And so you can turn up the 459th on your uh, computer today, and it'll come up. Or you, you can turn up my name, Bill Barron's, and it'll come up. And uh, there are several ways you can go about that. But they, this fellow was telling me that he had just had word from the Air Force, from the Graves Identification in that department. And the uh, name of, of Burma was changed to Miramar after the war because it became a military country. And anyway, they were clearing some large areas for the last couple of years of force, a heavy force there. And they found a P-38 and the remains of a pilot, the skeleton in there, and his name tag still on him and everything was covered all in the forest. And this fellow was calling me, he got my name off the internet, and to tell me that the name, everything is gelling with Ballmeister, his cousin. And so I've also heard from another person that said that they heard that uh, Duke who was Walter Duke, was the, the top ace over there. And they have found his remains and his plane in the jungle. I don't know just where. But they all told me, as we get information, he'll get it to me. So we'll see. But anyway, that was the end on the last day then. Uh, the 459th, the number was canceled. And that was it. And immediately, a squadron, an advanced training squadron in Texas, picked up the 459th, only instead of 459th Fighter Squadron, there's this 459th Fighter Training Squadron. So they asked me to come back last year, but it, uh, I had to go to Edwards Air Force Base instead, so I couldn't make it. And he said, we have a whole class graduating, and they know what the 459th was about, and what it did, and, and everything. So uh, we were able to destroy over 200 of those Japanese planes in that time, but we did lose 28. I don't know how many of you have been in combat or that, but when you're in combat and there's eight of you and anywhere is up to 20 or 25 or 30 even, whatever it was, against you, uh, I don't care what your religion, I don't care anything about how dedicated you are or anything else. And you're sitting in that plane all by yourself. I can tell you it's really not hard to speak to the Good Lord, up of all, ask for a little bit of, of help on this one. And I don't know anybody, any of the pilots, that went over with me, at least, that didn't really believe in God. Uh, if they didn't, they soon did. Uh, I want to say something else here that Bill did not bring up. Uh, he was on a mission, him and another pilot, and... Um, the top ace of all Indochina came up and 
took Bill on in combat. Bill shot him down. And that made Bill an ace with his fifth official kill. Our government always does not back our servicemen. Bill's wingman told him he would verify his kill because they had to have verification. You could just go back and say, I shot down two planes today. You'd have to have somebody, excuse me, to verify that. And he told him, he says, I will verify it, Bill. A few minutes later, he was shot down, wounded, and died at the hands of the Japanese. So he had no verification. And Bill come back not knowing that he'd been shot down and told them that he got another plane, they could put it on his marking on his plane. But then he had no backing, so he couldn't prove it. It wasn't until about 10 years ago, maybe, that Bill finally got verification from a historian in Japan. Uh, Bill had contacted him, and uh, he um, went into the Japanese archives, and he found the mission that this Japanese ace, top ace, was flying that day and described that when he got shot down, they had put down in their records exactly as it happened. Bill didn't know what was in those records from Japan, but Bill's account had always been the same, very same thing. Uh, our federal government would not, still would not give Bill credit. How many of you heard the deal the other day where they were giving the Medal of Honor to all these, these guys? How many years later from Vietnam, they're just now getting it? And that's what I'm talking about. They didn't honor the guys, and so they still refused. Bill did not know what uh, I was doing. I told Bill's wife, I said, I'm going to see what I can do. I got to thinking, Bill was inducted in the service in California. He took the oath in California. He was serving the state of California as well as our nation. All the time he was serving, he was representing California. He was discharged in California. So I went to the California legislature and I lobbied that Bill should be given credit for his ace for shooting down the top Japanese ace in Burma. And I took copies of the Japanese records as well as what Bill had always said in the records and I lobbied. Alan Nakanishi, I don't know if any of you know him from Lodi, yeah. um, worked with me on that and we got Senator Coghill in the uh, state senate and I lobbied the state senate and through both of them I was able to get Bill his A status for the through the state of California, which he received his honor for. And uh, uh, Bill, Bill did not know that I had done this. And so I told Bill, I said, Bill, I said, we gotta go speak to the businessmen group in Sacramento. But I gotta stop by the Capitol for a minute. So Bill had no idea what was happening. His wife, a lot of our P-38 friends and his family and my family were by the front steps of the Capitol. I took Bill in the back door, walked through the Capitol so we'd come down the steps, and Alan Nakanishi was out there with a big resolution declaring Bill an ace. And uh, Alan was standing there, we walked down the steps and the sun was in our eyes, and. Bill didn't even, still didn't know what was going on. And when we got down there, I walked up to Alan, and then Alan started reading it. Captain 
William Barron's. And then Bill looked up and he saw Alan reading this thing about him. And then his wife steps out of the crowd. And I had notified the fighter aces of Southern California that this was going to happen. And I asked them if they wanted to be there. So they said yes. So uh, the uh, president of the Fighter Aces Association came from Los Angeles for this thing, ceremony. Well, the next day was the P-38 meeting of my group that I ran. And uh, so Miller from the Fighter Aces Association came the next morning at our meeting and pronounced Bill an ace and told him that they wanted him to speak at a fighter aces symposium and so that was Bill's first act as, as an official ace of uh, P-38 ace in Burma. But uh, 